As I read Brianne Colchain's opening account of the famous marathon runner Philippides, I could not help thinking about how far Philippides ran. Over 300 miles in just a few days. He ran 140 miles each way from Athens to Sparta and back again at the command of Athenian generals. Maybe this guy just loved running. But he had to be super patriotic too. Because even after fighting at Marathon all day, he ran another 26 miles to deliver a warning to the city of Athens about approaching Persian ships. Hell, my hat's off to Philippides, because this guy delivered, even though he then died. Chank writes that Philippides dies at the end of his run, extinguished, as it were, by the deed that distinguishes him as a reliable postman. What's the motto? Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. This motto is actually not the postal carrier's motto. It's an inscription on the New York General Post Office building. In fact, the creed goes back to something Herodotus wrote about couriers, which takes us back to Philippides. Why so important in our historical record? What does privileging happens? What privileging happens, I should say? Chang says that everything archival finds its place and comes to pass within the opening coordinated by this principle of privilege, the principle of privileged access. But the archives are built based on prior archives. In the 19th century, the, Olympic, uh, the Olympics ad adopted the event called the Marathon, and one of the more memorable marathons was 1908, when Durando Pietra won, or Pietri won. But then he was disqualified because he had received assistance just before the finish line. Out of 75 competitors that day, only 27 finished the race. Pietri's disqualification gave first place to the American, Johnny Hayes, who had finished second. And Hayes' victory opened the gate for a sudden increase in American long-distance running, which is interesting, since the marathon I always seem to check in on is the Boston Marathon. I forget whether it was the first or not, but it's an important marathon. And these days, so many people participate in that marathon. In fact, about a half a million Americans run in all the marathons in the U.S. each year. But the Boston event last year, it seemed like the explosions meant to bring injury and death at the end of the race only created a new archival direction of vigilance about terrorism in public space. A manhunt man ensued, which included locking down most of the city in a manner not seen since Nazi-style lockdowns of cities in Jewish areas of Europe. Two young Chechen American men that even Russia and Chechnya both condemned were targeted, eventually ending in one being killed in a shootout and the other captured. The palpable power of the national security state fell on Boston like a bomb itself, exploding previously held notions of civility and daily activities. The countervailing demonstration by media sources of runners and bystanders surviving suggested an upbeat resilience despite the many who survived only after amputations and the lockdown of the city. Chang, <clears throat> Chang argues that archives speak silently to voices of the past, of the other. Silence follows Philippides. What follows the victims of the Boston Marathon bombing were personal interest stories and stories of survival documented as to show the power of overcoming a traumatic event. But do these portraits really tell all, or are they sent into silence in the archive? For the Greeks, overcoming the Persians and uniting the Greek city-states is embedded in Philippides' silence. For Americans, Boston's comeback is sports-like victory, concealing a darker, although perhaps necessary, silence of a police state. <laughs>